we learn the truth from John's vision and from history. The woman astride the beast is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Revelation 17, verse 6. It is a horrible picture, but one which history fully authenticates for Rome alone and no other city. Every citizen in the empire was required to be a Roman Catholic. Failure to give wholehearted allegiance to the Pope was considered treason against the state, punishable by death. Here was the basis for slaughtering millions. As Islam would be a few centuries later, a paganized Christianity was imposed upon the entire populace of Europe under the threat of torture and death. Thus, Roman Catholicism became the most persecuting faith the world has ever seen, commanding the throne to impose the Christian, that is, Catholic religion, on all its subjects. Innocent III murdered far more Christians in one afternoon than any Roman emperor did in his entire reign. Will Durant writes candidly, quote, Compared with the persecution of heresy in Europe from 1227 to 1492, the persecution of Christians by the Romans in the first three centuries after Christ was a mild and humane procedure. Making every allowance required by an historian and permitted to a Christian, we must rank the Inquisition, along with the wars and persecutions of our time, as among the darkest blots on the record of mankind, revealing a ferocity unknown in any beast." End quote. Of course, not all dissenters openly proclaimed their disloyalty to Rome. There were secret heretics who had to be sought out diligently. The method devised was the Inquisition. In the opinion of Egyptian author Rollo Ahmed, quote, the most pitiless and ferocious institution the world has ever known, end quote, in its destruction of lives, property, morals, and human rights. Lord Acton, a Catholic, called the Inquisition murderous and declared that the popes, quote, were not only murderers in the great style, but they made murder a legal basis for the Christian church and the condition of salvation, end quote. No absolution for Rome. Roman Catholic apologists deceitfully try to absolve their church of any responsibility in the actual burnings of heretics. They claimed that the Inquisition was the work of the state. On the contrary, the binding force of the laws against heretics lay not in the authority of secular princes, but in the sovereign dominion of life and death over all Christians claimed by the popes as God's representatives on earth. As Innocent III expressly states it, the penalties were executed by the civil authorities, but only as the secular arm of the church. Innocent III commanded the Archbishop of Auch in Gascony, quote, We give you a strict command, that by whatever means you can, you destroy all these heresies. You may cause the princes and people to suppress them with the sword. End of quote. The Pope offered a plenary indulgence to the king and nobles of France for aid in suppressing the Catharist heresy. To Philip Augustus, in return for such aid, the Pope offered the lands of all who should fail to join in a crusade against the Albigensians. Comte Le Maestre, in his letters written in 1815 to justify the Spanish Inquisition, states that it existed, quote, by virtue of the bull of the sovereign pontiff, end quote, and that the Grand Inquisitor is always either an archbishop or bishop. If the authorities refused to execute the condemned, they would themselves be brought before the tribunal and consigned to the flames. It was the popes themselves who invented the Inquisition and saw that it was carried out. Gregory the Ninth in 1233 handed over the office of the Inquisition in permanence to the Dominicans, but always to be exercised in the name and by the authority of the Pope. As already noted, of eighty popes in a line from the 13th century on, not one of them disapproved of the theology and apparatus of the Inquisition. On the contrary, one after another added his own cruel touches to the workings of this deadly machine. We are not quoting Protestants or even ex-Catholics, but Catholic historians. Listen to the leading 19th century Catholic professor of church history. Quote, 
Through the influence of Gratian and unwearied activity of the popes and their legates since 1183, the view of the church had been that every departure from the teaching of the church and every important opposition to any ecclesiastical ordinances must be punished with death, and the most cruel of deaths by fire. Innocent III declared the mere refusal to swear and the opinion that oaths were unlawful a heresy worthy of death and directed that whoever differed in any respect from the common way of life of the multitude should be treated as a heretic. Both the initiation and carrying out of this new principle must be ascribed to the popes alone. It was the popes who compelled bishops and priests to condemn the heterodox to torture, confiscation of their goods, imprisonment, and death, and to enforce the execution of this sentence on the civil authorities under pain of excommunication. From 1200 to 1500, the long series of papal ordinances on the Inquisition, ever increasing in severity and cruelty, and their whole policy towards heresy runs on without a break. It is a rigidly consistent system of legislation. Every pope confirms and improves upon the devices of his predecessor. All is directed to the one end of completely uprooting every difference of belief. It was only the absolute dictation of the popes and the notion of their infallibility in all questions of evangelical morality that made the Christian world accept the Inquisition which contradicted the simplest principles of Christian justice and love to our neighbor, and would have been rejected with universal horror in the ancient church. End of quote. Far from being its originators, civil authorities often tried to resist the Inquisition, but they could not. Forced to carry out the sentence, executioners sometimes strangled the condemned before lighting the flames. Such acts of deficient mercy were unfortunately the rare exception. A few compassionate voices were raised within the church. St. Bernard pointed out that Christ had expressly forbidden the line of conduct afterwards prescribed by the popes, and that it could only multiply hypocrites and confirm and increase the hatred of mankind against a bloodthirsty and persecuting church and clergy. But most clergy agreed with the popes. Papal Decrees we often learn of secular resistance from papal decrees overruling it. Will Durant informs us that in 1521, Leo X issued the bull Onestus, which, quote, ordered the excommunication of any officials and the suspension of religious services in any community that refused to execute without examination or revision the sentences of the inquisitors, end quote. Consider Clement V's rebuke of King Edward II. Quote, we hear that you forbid torture as contrary to the laws of your land, but no state law can override the church's canon law, our law. Therefore, I command you at once to submit those men to torture. End quote. Pope Urban II, 1088 to 1099, inspirer of the First Crusade, decreed that all heretics were to be tortured and killed. That became a dogma of the church. Acclaimed as the angelic doctor, even St. Thomas Aquinas taught that non-Catholics or heretics could, after a second warning, be legitimately killed. His exact words are, quote, They have merited to be excluded from the earth by death, end quote. Pope Martin V, 1417 to 1431, commanded the King of Poland in 1429 to exterminate the Hussites, sympathizers with the martyred Jan Hus, who had fought back and had routed the Pope's army. The following from the Pope's letter to the King reinforces what we know of the evil of papal totalitarianism and tells us why Popes hated the Hussites and other independent Christians and wanted them destroyed. Quote, Know that the interest of the Holy See and those of your crown make it a duty to exterminate the Hussites. Remember that these impious persons dare proclaim principles of equality. They maintain that all Christians are brethren, and that God has not given to privileged men the right of ruling the nations. They hold that Christ came on earth to abolish slavery. They call the people to liberty. That is to the annihilation of kings and priests. 
While there is still time, then, turn your forces against Bohemia. Burn, massacre, make deserts everywhere. For nothing could be more agreeable to God or more useful to the cause of kings than the extermination of the Hussites. End of quote. The popes themselves were the authority behind the inquisitions. They wielded the power of life and death even over emperors. Had any pope opposed the inquisition, he could have stopped it, during his papacy at least. Where do we read that the popes thundered anathemas against the secular authorities who imposed so many and such gruesome deaths upon their victims? Never. Civil magistrates would have desisted from these loathsome murders in order to save their own souls, but papal orders to stop the inquisitions never came. On the contrary, the Roman pontiffs who originated and directed the inquisitions threatened excommunication against any who failed to carry out the inquisitor's decrees. Today's Catholic apologists deny the facts of history and accuse those who present the truth of being unscholarly. D. Antonio Gavin, a Catholic priest and eyewitness to the Spanish Inquisition, tells us, quote, The Roman Catholics believe there is a purgatory, and that the souls suffer more pains in it than in hell. But I think that the Inquisition is the only purgatory on earth, and the Holy Fathers, priests and popes, are the judges and executioners in it. The reader may form a dreadful idea of the barbarity of that tribunal by what I have already said, but I am sure it never will come up to what it is in reality, for it passeth all understanding. End quote. The dogmas remain today. Had Rome ever confessed the evil of her ferocious slaughter of millions of those whom she called heretics, and had she renounced the centuries of plunder and murder and wiped those doctrines from her books, then we could forget that horror. That she has not done so, however, requires us to face, no matter how unpleasant, the facts of history. Far from expressing shame for the execution of heretics, a popular American Catholic weekly in 1938 declared, quote, Heresy is an awful crime against God, and those who start a heresy are more guilty than they who are traitors to the civil government. If the state has a right to punish treason with death, the principle is the same that concedes to the spiritual authority, Roman Catholic Church, the power of life and death over the arch traitor, or heretic. End quote. Infallibility can never admit it was wrong. As John Fox reminds us in his Book of Martyrs, quote, A church which pretends to be infallible will always seek the destruction of those who dissent from it. End of quote. De Rosa points out that Pope John Paul II, quote, knows the church was responsible for persecuting Jews, for the Inquisition, for slaughtering heretics by the thousands, for reintroducing torture into Europe as part of the judicial process. But he has to be careful. The doctrines responsible for those terrible things still underpin his position. End of quote. Disobedience to the Pope became the epitome of heresy. Those guilty of it immediately lost any normal human rights and were summarily put to death. Consider Urban VIII's 1627 bull in Coena Domini, Gregory XI that first brought it out in 1372, and Gregory XII reconfirmed it in 1411, as did Pius V in 1568, who said it was to remain an eternal law in Christendom. Each pope added new touches until it was well-nigh impossible for an admitted non-Catholic to exist in Europe, much as it will be worldwide under Antichrist for any who do not submit totally to him. The bull excommunicates and curses all heretics and schismatics as well as all who favor or defend them, including all princes and magistrates. This bull is still in force today. Nor could it be otherwise, with the ex-cathedra pronouncements of four infallible popes behind it. The absolutism remains, even though Rome is not presently able to enforce it so blatantly. The Code of Canon Law, Canon 333, Part 3, declares, quote, There is neither appeal nor recourse against a decision or decree of the Roman pontiff. End quote. Vatican II, of course, says the same. 
The woman rides the beast, holding the reins. Incredible, but it happened. Heresy in the church's eyes was treated as treason against the crown. The church sought out the heretics, found them guilty, and handed them to the civil authorities for execution. As its secular arm, the state did the church's bidding in the execution of heretics, the confiscation of their property, and the enforcement of the church's decrees against them and their heirs.